live everywhere. Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, K Grow in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? Friday, August 2nd, 2019. Time for yet another show. Are we ready to do it? Well, uh, like I said, it is time. It doesn't really matter that much whether or not we're ready to do it. We're ready to go uh, regardless because it's nine. That's it. That's all there is to it. It's like an obligation. All right. Well, we've got plenty to catch up on today. It's not like there's a shortage of things to talk about. There never is, of course. And Friday is often the day we give over to uh, pulling out, the, well, a couple of stories usually that uh, I think you'll probably end up discussing over the weekend or be forced to discuss at some point, whether you like it or not. I, I suppose among those would be uh, the New York Times story about, as we mentioned yesterday, only briefly, Jeffrey Epstein wanting various parts of him frozen. Someone will probably approach you about that over the weekend. <clears throat> uh, hopefully not offering you a cryogenic deal. Turn them down if they do. It's not going to work. Although, hey, you know, what am I? who am I to get in the way of this guy's uh, plans for freezing himself? As a matter of fact, I think he should start right away. And uh, by, you know, uh, uh, actually but measured by the parts of which he's decided to have frozen, the parts of them which he's decided to freeze, I would think uh, the sooner the better, as a matter of fact. And uh, I would even be willing to say <clears throat> I would endorse the idea of freezing that Jeffrey Epstein penis before the rest of them, the head or whatever. But uh, I guess if you wanted to start with the head, you should just go ahead and... I don't see any reason to delay things. It's only making him wait that much longer to awaken unthawed in the great unfrozen future. So I would say, go ahead, go for it. Why not? And uh, I guess short of being able to freeze those parts of him, we ought to all just freeze ourselves at this point, because otherwise... We have to live in a world where he's walking around free, it seems. All right. Though they got him locked up at the moment. So, okay. Um, somebody may freeze him involuntarily at any point uh, this week, I suppose. <clears throat> All right. Plenty of other stories, much more important, of course, to cover. Uh, we have some requests on the table, uh, some that will require in-depth discussion, others that uh, can be dismissed rather quickly. <clears throat> Got some old stories to revive. Let's just head right over to Pocket and uh, and see what markers I've left behind for myself as reminders. Let's see. I guess starting off, um, well, maybe a few short items just to sort of get things rolling. And uh, then we can head to the procedure questions, which, as I said, I've already got some requests in. But just thought I would make mention of the fact that I learned uh, yesterday from the New York Times, that everyone's favorite district attorney, Cyrus Vance Jr., I guess he's looking to redeem himself somehow in all of this. I hope that's what he's he's up to. Who, who really knows? It's hard to tell. But uh, Cyrus Vance is notorious now, uh, though a Democrat, for essentially letting lots of high-profile people who could otherwise face criminal charges. Among them, many members, immediate family members of, of Donald Trump, Ivanka, Don Jr., Eric, they, they were all facing possible indictment over one or another of their dubious real estate deals. And he has dropped the charges time and again. So he may be looking to redeem himself. It is an elected position, after all, and people are just now becoming aware of the the fact that it is one and that uh, at some point in the near future, people will get a chance to dump him. So this is the headline I picked up on yesterday. Manhattan DA subpoenas Trump organization over Stormy Daniels hush money. Well, of course, you know, we already knew that there was a case there and that uh, there was potential liability. So it's not groundbreaking. But remember, we just heard that the... Uh, Southern District of New York, the U.S. attorney there has ended up declining to bring any charges in that case, even though there was some pretty clear evidence that there were 
violations of law. Uh, for whatever reason, this, I think, being one of the 14 outstanding matters still pending, even at the conclusion of the Mueller investigation, uh, Bill Barr came in as attorney general and poof, suddenly the sovereign district of New York, as Greg likes to call it, uh, has uh, decided eh, maybe there's no there there after all. But I guess uh, the Manhattan D.A., is not bound by that. Obviously, it's not a guess. The Manhattan DA won't be bound by the federal Department of Justice's decision not to bring federal charges. So, you know, maybe he's looking to bolster his image among Democrats there, or I don't know, for whatever reason, he could be, of course, <clears throat> uh, pulling yet another one of these stunts and just uh, going to consider and dismiss state charges as well just as an additional favor to the Trump family. I don't know what this guy Cyrus Vance is all about. All right, so here's the story. Ben Protests and William K. Rushbaum are the reporters on this piece. State prosecutors in Manhattan subpoenaed President Trump's family business on Thursday, reviving an investigation into the company's role in hush money payments made during the 2016 presidential campaign, according to people briefed on the matter. The subpoena issued by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office demanded the Trump Organization provide documents related to money that had been used to buy the silence of Stormy Daniels. You know who she is? We'll move on from there. The inquiry from the District Attorney's Office, which is in early stages, is examining whether any senior executives at the company filed false business records about the hush money, which would be a state crime, the people said. Mark L. Mukasey the uh, attorney and attorney uh, for the Trump organization, Mark with the C, by the way, uh, called the inquiry a political hit job. Oh, no, not one of those. We hate those. It's just harassment of the president. Ah, I've heard that line before. His family and his businesses using subpoenas as weapons. We will respond as appropriate. Blah, blah, blah. The investigation will focus on a $130,000 payment. Michael D. Cohen, the president's lawyer and fixer at the time, and can we just pause briefly to note for the record that it is uh, it's it's problematic that the president of the United States had a fixer at any point. We just sort of say that as uh, in an offhand remark because uh, we know it's true, but uh, it ought to be noted that this is a this is a shady thing to have, and presidents ought not to have people who can claim to have been fixers like that. Anyway, okay, so Cohen uh, gave Ms. Daniels this $130,000 at the time. Mr. Cohen also helped arrange for a tabloid media company to pay the Playboy model Karen McDougal, a second woman who said she had had an illicit, uh, I, I added illicit, they didn't bother calling it illicit, affair with the president. The disclosure of the payments ignited a scandal that threatened to derail the Trump presidency. Really? Well, you would never have known it. The Manhattan District Attorney's Office on Thursday separately subpoenaed the media company American Media Incorporated, the publisher of National Enquirer. The subpoenas from Cyrus R. Vance Jr., the Manhattan District Attorney, came only weeks after the Trump Organization had appeared to fend off federal scrutiny of the same payments. The United States Attorney's Office in Manhattan, which charged Mr. Cohen last year with campaign finance violations in the hush money case, revealed in a court filing last month that prosecutors had effectively concluded their inquiry, signaling that it was unlikely to file additional charges. But state law makes it a crime to falsify business records, offering the Manhattan District Attorney's Office another avenue. The Trump Organization reimbursed Mr. Cohen for his payment to Ms. Daniels, State prosecutors are examining whether the company and any of its senior executives then falsely listed the reimbursement as a legal expense, the people briefed on the matter said. Following the groundwork laid in the federal investigation, the district attorney's office is expected to scrutinize the senior ranks of the company, although it is unclear whether the inquiry will reach the president. Mr. Trump has denied the affairs and any wrongdoing. Well, that's all obviously crap. Uh, while Mr. Cohen has said he arranged the hush money at the direction of Mr. Trump, and federal prosecutors have since repeated the accusation in court papers. 
Less is publicly known about the president's role. Well, he was the one who had the affair and said to pay the money. I think we all actually know that. Mr. Cohen is currently serving a three-year prison sentence in Otisville, New York, if you'd like to visit. A spokesman for American Media Incorporated, the media company that was subpoenaed, yes, you said that, did not respond for a request for comment, to a request for comment. The company bought the rights to McDougal's story of an affair with Trump and never ran the story. The company, whose leader was friends with Trump, cooperated with the federal investigation, maybe, and received a non-prosecution agreement. The district attorney's office initially considered mounting the inquiry nearly a year ago after Cohen pleaded guilty. Vance's office paused at the request of federal prosecutors. Vance's latest foray into the hush money case could present a legal and political quandary. Trump's lawyers will try to portray Vance, a Democrat, as a as leading a partisan attack. Certainly not leading it, but OK, he's helping make it. Earlier this year, similar criticism was leveled by a lawyer for Paul Manafort, Trump's former campaign chairman. Uh, did it work? I don't know. He's in jail. You tell me. After Manafort was convicted of federal crimes, Vance's office charged him with state felonies in hopes he would still face prison sentence, a sentence if he received a presidential pardon. Still, if Vance declined to bring charges in the hush money case, the decision could fuel criticism that he has pulled punches with the Trump family. His office previously declined to charge two of Mr. Trump's children, Ivanka and Donald Jr., I guess Eric got left out of that, who were under criminal investigation in 2012 over allegations that they misled buyers interested in the Trump Soho Hotel condominium project. Spokesman for Vance declined to comment on Thursday's subpoenas. Even if the new investigation ultimately leads to charges, state law would limit the severity of the punishment. A charge of filing false business records could amount to a misdemeanor. It becomes a felony only if prosecutors can prove that the filing was done to commit or conceal another crime. It is unclear whether, under the law, state prosecutors can cite the federal campaign finance violations as that other crime. So, that'll be exciting to figure out as a legal question. We can put all our legal eagles to work on the matter, but I just thought I would throw that one out there in case that one comes up over the weekend. Also kind of a short piece to uh, look at just to sort of set the stage. There's another weird one out there that uh, perhaps deserves some mention. I'll turn to Think Progress for this one. Uh, that's where I first caught the news. This is a, another sort of bizarre development in a very weird and still unraveling tale of Maria Butina, Remember the uh, the Russian spy lady who was having an affair with the Republican operative and was doing all the crazy NRA coordination work? Seems she had an affair with another prominent person, less prominent, less less widely known as a Republican, I guess. And I'm not even sure that the person really counts themselves as a Republican, but it. It's a weird situation. It's it's the CEO of Overstock.com. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought he'd found himself, he'd find himself mixed up in all of this. And uh, Maria Butina is getting a lot of action. I gotta say, it's pretty weird. Uh, I'm not really sure what drives it. Although this is a kind of a crazy story, and uh, you'll you'll hear what drives some of it, at least for this Overstock.com guy. We, I would have thought he would have been, you know, I don't know, windsurfing out in California or something, but this is what he's doing with his time. In a series of revelations over the past week, we are told by Casey Michael, writing for, again, for Think Progress, the CEO of Overstock.com has claimed that he had a sexual relationship with convicted Russian agent Maria Butina and that the FBI encouraged him to continue such a relationship. How odd is that? One of Butina's lawyers, Robert Driscoll, revealed in a letter to the Justice Department last month that the 57-year-old Byrne maintained a relationship with Butina. Byrne said that he initially met her at the 2015 Freedom Fest. That's where I pick up all my chicks. Freedom Fest. What? Okay. This is an annual libertarian convention. I, I, okay. So, I mean, 
does that mean that the CEO of Overstock.com is a is a libertarian tech bro or something? I mean, he's 57. That's usually out of the the range there. But I guess once you get your hands on a uh, on a big name dot com, uh, I suppose you're probably running around with too much money. And that makes you into a libertarian. I guess you can go to Freedom I guess if you're 57 and you can go to Freedom Fest and pick up libertarian chicks, I guess it works. I don't know. That's sort of a, you know, alien lifestyle, but whatever. Anyway, he said Butina claimed she was working for Alexander Torshin, which she was, who was then working as an official at the Russian Central Bank. That's the sort of thing, I guess, that would prick up the ears of an overstock.com guy. Oh, somebody who could, you know, steer a billion dollars in venture capital my way. Torshin, who has been accused by authorities in Europe of overseeing massive money laundering operations, is now sanctioned by the U.S. for his role in Russia's kleptocratic regime. <clears throat> well put there, but think progress. You can depend on, I guess, for saying such things. Uh, the letter from the attorney to who? Who does he send this to? Uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, is embedded in the in the piece here. Um, I don't know that we benefit by plowing through the letter itself. We'll just look at Think Progress is right up here. Byrne added that Butina claimed she was working at Torsion's behest in order to build up contacts in the administration of whoever won the 2016 election saying she wanted to allow Russian liberals, that's what she said, Russian liberals a platform within the new White House. It's unclear which Russian liberals Butina would have been describing. Not only was Torshin firmly in the pro-government camp in Russia, but Butina has previously been one of the most outspoken figures supporting Russia's attempts to disintegrate Ukraine, including promoting the arming of pro-Kremlin separatists in Ukraine. As Think Progress has reported, at least one other sanctioned Russian, Alexander Malkovich, is currently involved in fundraising on Butina's behalf. Byrne says he developed an intimate relationship with Butina through early 2016. She had a lot going on. After which it was broken off. I'm not going to tell you what was broken off, but um, we'll just assume they mean the relationship. Driscoll's letter noted that Byrne said he had a, quote, non-standard arrangement. That's, quote, non-standard arrangement, unquote, with the FBI, and that he, quote, communicated and assisted government agents with their investigation of Maria. The letter notes that American officials instructed Byrne to restart his relationship with Butina in the lead-up to the 2016 election. That is very unusual sounding, to say the least. Um, but And uh, just an additional layer. One, it's unusual that the FBI would say, you know what, um, Overstock.com CEO, we think you should start dating or resume dating this suspected Russian spy who might be trying to uh, uh, steer the outcome of the American election and uh, also uh, help arm pro-Russian uh, forces in, in Ukraine and destroy the country and maybe destroy your country along with it. I, you know, we're just not entirely sure. I, I, I can understand them wanting informants. I just don't, I have a hard time believing that they thought that a really good low key way of doing this would be to, talk to the CEO of Overstock.com and say, yeah, you got to really start dating and having sex with this Russian spy. And uh, that seems unusual enough. I guess add on top of it that, again, he said he met her at the 2015 Libertarian Gathering of Freedom Fest. So how unlikely is it that probably at this point, independently wealthy 57-year-old CEO libertarian tech bro from overstock.com says i'm so libertarian that i'm going to i'm going to actually follow through on demands from the fbi that i begin a relationship with this suspected honeypot spy on behalf of the united states government of course because i'm such a huge libertarian 
Nothing says libertarian more than government operative, right? I I find that a little difficult to believe. But uh, stranger things have happened, I guess. As the letter read, this is the letter from his lawyer, at some point prior to the 2016 election, when Burns' contact with Maria diminished or ceased, the government asked and encouraged him to renew contact with her, and he did so. Why? He's a libertarian. Continuing to inform the government of her activities. He's just, he's a very patriotic libertarian. Maybe that's it. Byrne states he was informed by government agents that his pursuit and involvement with Maria and concomitant, 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 where, where's the emphasis belong there? His, his uh, I guess we'll say subsequent surveillance of her was requested and directed from the highest levels of the FBI and intelligence community. And that just sounds like, you know, tech bro CEO garbage at some point, but I'd like to know whether the FBI would confirm something like that. That's an interesting thing. I oh, I was just caught dating this now notorious spy. Um, but why come out and uh, admit it? I think it was pretty much quiet and nobody really cared who the CEO of Overstock.com was dating. So um, the idea of coming out and saying that as though someone had caught him at it and, and then saying, well, I only was doing that because the FBI made me and I'm a huge libertarian. I don't know what this is supposed to mean. It's just bizarre. Byrne later denied that his second portion, this second portion of his relationship with Butina was intimate. The second period, I did it because I was instructed to rekindle it. That's not the, the term I would use if it was not intimate, but okay. However, I decided that it was not the right thing to do. I would have probably come to that conclusion a little earlier, but... He's being libertarian about it, I guess. He, he, he reserves the right to explore his feelings for the government. Byrne told the Washington Examiner all of this. Uh, the second period, uh, I was instructed to rekindle it. I thought it was a, not the right thing to do. This is what he said to the Examiner. But I was told where the orders came from. And the orders came from high enough that I accepted the orders. I just want America to know that I didn't lay a finger on her that second time. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's exoneration. What a uh, strong individual personality he is, though, right? The FBI said I should go out with her, so I did. And I'm a libertarian. Driscoll's letter noted that Byrne claimed Butina's behavior and interaction with him was inconsistent with her being a foreign agent and more likely an idealist, an age-appropriate peace activist. The the gun-loving peace activist, sure. Absolutely. Also, we think there should be war in Ukraine because of peace. The letter added that Byrne conveyed Byrne's thoughts and the corroborating facts and observations about Maria to the government. This is the first time Byrne's name has been linked with Butina. Byrne said that he met with Justice Department officials earlier this year, but his relationship with Butina never came up during Butina's prosecution. It is also the second known romantic relationship Putin uh, carried out in the U.S. The other was with another 57-year-old. That was the GOP operative Paul Erickson, who was charged earlier this year with wire fraud. 57 is just a thing with her, I guess. I don't know. Maybe she just likes Heinz 57 sauce. I got no idea what she's up to. I have been involved with three peace efforts in my life, and stranger things have happened than that someone positive came from such an encounter says someone, not something. Someone positive came from such an encounter, Byrne said. However, I was also keenly aware that she might be a red sparrow instead. He's quite the super spy, this guy is. I don't know. I, I am not certain where that's supposed to lead. It may be a total dead end. I'm just saying that's very odd, and you ought to be aware of the fact that it exists, and no one knows what will come of the story. All right. Let's see. We can do one last thing, I think, before the break. I thought I would share with you the Twitter thread of Katrina Mulligan. Katrina Mulligan, a national security and foreign policy enthusiast, as she says, currently at the Center for American Progress. And apparently she has some considerable experience inside the national security uh, apparatus, including work at the NSC, the DOJ, the ODNI, relevant, of course, and the NCTC, which doesn't actually ring a bell to me right away, but we could look it up maybe during the break. 
All right. Here's what she had to say. Uh, following up on this continuing story of John Ratcliffe, whose whose nomination, such as it is, still remains pending. Again, uh, never forget that uh, uh, you, you must demand to see the paperwork. It may be that this has not yet been formalized as a nomination. Anyway, she says Trump's DNI pick, Ratcliffe's national security resume is even thinner than he's portrayed it. And we've portrayed it as pretty thin. And not just because no one can find examples of him actually prosecuting a terrorism case. He's misrepresenting his role in, quote, overseeing terrorism cases entirely. And the DOJ attorneys know it. Ratcliffe repeatedly touted his experience as a prosecutor as his primary national security credential, claiming that he, quote, personally managed dozens of international and domestic terrorism investigations, a claim that has already proven to be scandalously overstated. Ratcliffe also claims he was appointed by President Bush, that's a key part of the claim, as, quote, Chief of Anti-Terrorism and National Security in the Eastern District of Texas. DOJ formers, myself included, scratched our heads when we saw that because that role doesn't exist. Ratcliffe is presumably referring to the Anti-Terrorism Advisory Council, or N. Our ATAC, another uh, bit of alphabet soup here. Um, so the Anti-Terrorism Advisory Council coordinator job, I guess, is what they think he's talking about. A role that is nowhere near as significant as Ratcliffe has represented. After 9-11, what is this thing? The AG issued a directive that tasked each U.S. attorney with coordinating an ATAC within their district. Each office was required to designate an ATAC coordinator, typically a line prosecutor, to ensure certain largely administrative responsibilities were completed. It wasn't much of anything at all. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGRO in the Morning, with a brand new, brand new interruption to say thanks to all of you who support the show. Remember when I told you that our average monthly donation was about $7, for which you were getting two great hours of news and entertainment five days a week, and how that came out to about 70 cents an hour? That's a pretty good deal, except it's wrong. The math actually works out closer to 17 cents an hour. It is hard to beat a deal like that, and even harder to send your kids to college on. Thankfully, Patreon.com makes it easy to make that work. Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com, is the simple, secure way to make recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Just search for me or the show name on the site, and they make it easy to crowdfund the show so that the power of our numbers can keep the show going for just a few bucks a month. Once again, thanks so much for all your support. Welcome back now to the Cake Growing in the Morning Show here on At Roots Radio. And I realize our music came in a little bit late on the uh, on the start. And that may have fooled me about uh, when we were cutting out for the break. So uh, if any of the last bit of Katrina Mulligan's uh, tweet in her tweet thread got cut off, I'll just pick up just before where I think we left off. Um, or I guess we can recap just in case you're joining us late for whatever reason. But uh, Katrina Mulligan, a national security and foreign policy, uh, what? Well, she says enthusiast, but uh, clearly she's got a professional role in writing about it, I would guess, at the Center for American Progress. So she may be there for entirely different reasons. Uh, bringing her national security background to bear on analyzing John Ratcliffe's claims to have had this prominent anti-terrorism role in the Department of Justice. And it appears it was uh, even more ridiculous and inflated than we thought. Not only did we learn earlier this week <clears throat> that Radcliffe's uh, record of or claims about having prosecuted terrorism cases were inflated, he also made this claim uh, about having been appointed by President Bush as Chief of Anti-Terrorism and National Security in the Eastern District of Texas. So there is no such position, apparently, and near as Katrina can make out, it is probably that he was given the duties of the Anti-Terrorism Advisory Council 
coordinator, a role nowhere near as significant as Ratcliffe has represented, as she says. So the deal on these uh, these positions is that after 9-11, the attorney general issued a directive tasking each U.S. attorney in the country with establishing and then coordinating with an anti-terrorism advisory council. Don't know who would be on such a council, but uh, it's limited to each U.S. attorney district. Anyway, each office was also then required to assign somebody from the district, from the U.S. attorney's office to be the coordinator of this anti-terrorism advisory council, usually just one of the, as they call them, line prosecutors, one of the subordinate prosecutors that works in the U.S. attorney's office, would have the job of making sure that the ATAC met every once in a while and kept minutes and did the things that they were supposed to do. As she says, uh, they would ensure that certain largely administrative responsibilities were completed. It, and by the way, it is not a presidential appointment as Ratcliffe's campaign website implies. It's a bureaucratic duty that you're assigned by your supervisor, not the president of the United States. So what does an anti-terrorism, what do they call it, anti-terrorism advisory council coordinator do? In a jurisdiction like the Eastern District of Texas at that time, not much. They convene a meeting with the FBI field office a couple times a year uh, a year to understand whether there are any terrorism investigations underway and I guess inform their anti-terrorism advisory council of what they find out. They also ensure connectivity back to the National Security Division of the DOJ if certain terrorism charges are being considered inside of their district. And at the time, very uncommon in the Eastern District of Texas for there to have been any terrorism-related cases underway. There's also training for the members of the Anti-Terrorism Advisory Councils once a year. So there's that. Uh, she says, you know, it's, I've, I've been to it, and it's at the National uh, NAC, which I, I am guessing is something like the National Anti-Terrorism Center. So if you're on an anti-terrorism advisory council and you don't know what to do, they will train you. Once a year, they will train you as to what the hell it is you're supposed to be doing. All of once a year, these trainings go on. And the anti-terrorism advisory council coordinator makes sure you get tickets. That's the job, Radcliffe. That's that's his national security experience. An ATAC coordinator is largely an administrative role, she goes on to say. In many jurisdictions, it's a role line attorneys assume in addition to other roles and other duty as assigned kind of job, right? In other words, uh, like, okay, who's in charge of making sure that the coffee machine has enough stuff? You know, okay, and uh, I need some some poor sap to take over as anti-terrorism advisory council coordinator. You got to make sure that these guys go to their training, um, meet with the field office of the FBI a couple times a year, ask them if there's any anti-terrorism action going on. Uh, if there is, uh, tell the people about it if you can, if it's not classified, at some meeting. That's basically it. In some jurisdictions... She says it can be more substantive, and I imagine you might find more action on that in New York, possibly Los Angeles, Boston, some of the larger cities where there might conceive, I mean, you know, the danger of terrorism, uh, in, or I guess uh, they were thinking about foreign terrorism, taking root in, uh, in the form of a plot in the United States. It was mostly, I think, city-based that uh, they suspected where they would find uh, immigrant communities who might have been recruited to the cause. Of course, they weren't looking for domestic terrorism because that wasn't really super serious as a crime back then. And, of course, they only barely consider that to be a crime now. More on that later. Anyway, um, at this point in uh, the Eastern District of Texas, from 2004 to 2007, it just wasn't a big part of anybody's day. To summarize, she says, a guy who lied about his involvement in the only two terrorism cases he was actually tied to is also lying about his title, ATAC coordinator, and how he got the role, not appointed by the president. He was assigned by a mid-level supervisor. 
Given these pretty serious discrepancies, more scrutiny of his claims is in order. Has anyone looked into his claim that he served as, quote, a member of the AGAC on terrorism and national security? Did he even have a security clearance during that time? What level? The Senate should consider carefully whether they want to confirm a DNI whose only qualifications appear to be one, having worked on tangential motions related to one, maybe two, terrorism cases. Uh, two, serving as the ATAC coordinator in the Eastern District of Texas, a largely administrative role. Three, serving as an acting U.S. attorney for under a year. And four, serving as an intelligence committee member for seven months. The IRTPA requires that the DNI, you remember that's the statute that requires that the DNI have extensive national security experience. And it does require this for good reason. Ratcliffe is not only hyper-partisan and unqualified, he's also dishonest. The absolute worst qualities I can imagine having in a DNI. But of course, the only thing that stands in the way is politics and the law. So that's not going to be very much help. Now, is it? Uh, I said there would be perhaps more on uh, one particular angle of this subject. Uh, I'm trying to remind myself of what it was. It was about uh, Radcliffe himself. I should have uh, made a check mark next to the thing where I'm going to scroll through this and uh, take a look here. Any other reminders? What was it? Someone uh, who was listening, maybe I could say, uh, you can tell me what was it that I said more about that later. Uh, was it appointments to the president by the presidency or training once a year? Now I can't remember. I'll see if it comes up again as we thumb through what else is in pocket. Maybe now uh, might be a good time then to turn to the uh, procedural questions <clears throat> which were posed to me. Uh, and we'll see if we can't, uh, along the way, figure out what it was that I was trying to get at here. Hmm. Uh, okay. I am, uh, oh, look at this. I, I'm only just now seeing Bill in Portland, Maine's uh, morning tweet, and I've missed the whole thing, and it only showed up in my timeline now, although it is m properly marked uh, as 39 minutes ago. What am I supposed to be doing? I should check in on this. Before uh, Daily Coast Radio, obviously, live 39 minutes ago. We've been in at this uh, for some time here. But uh, let's see. Before Kager Rux can utter a single word, I'm calling the roll. <laughs> okay. So, yes, a procedural issue right there. Um, okay. He's, he's, he's pleased at having owned me here in the service of my squirrel overlords. Yes, it's true. Once you, uh, on the Senate floor, suggest the absence of a quorum, there's nothing I can do. Once the to, to stop the clerk from calling the roll, I can, of course, ask for unanimous consent that the roll call be suspended. But you know how tricky those squirrels are. They'll probably object and we'll be stuck here listening to their names being called. OK, so I had uh, this request, I guess you could say, Serena Blaze, uh, who frequently contributes to the show with their own recorded segments, has asked this question or or suggested this topic, um, responding to a uh, a friend here on Twitter who's perplexed by yesterday's developments in the Senate Judiciary Committee. The uh, thread containing the request begins here with uh, the tweet of Time Killer S. <laughs> so watch out. Or time killer S who says uh, asks whether Lindsey Graham's inappropriate behavior as chair of the committee yesterday can uh, as as they put it here be part of the official record and moreover since he was out of order can this sham vote be stricken let's find out what they're talking about I know you might as well uh, this uh, refers to or or plays off of Pat Leahy's complaint tweet yesterday in which he says <clears throat> chairman graham just broke four committee rules in order to advance president trump's bill 
to lock up immigrant children indefinitely. <clears throat> you probably, I mean, may have heard about this bill, and we can read a little bit about it. I think Diane Feinstein also spent a lot of time uh, critiquing this bill and complaining about the procedure around it as well, um, and, and well-founded complaints just you know, won't lead to anything. Rules every Republican voted for six months ago, Leahy reminds us. Rules I always respected as chairman. And that's actually kind of part of Pat Leahy's problem as chairman. But uh, they might as well rip up the rules. So I did it for them. And, uh, well, there you go. Uh, so, ah, thanks very much. Also, I've just got my note here from Scott Anderson saying, by the way, the thing you said there would be more about. And now where's my... There's a pen. Give me a pen. Give me a piece of paper. It was domestic terrorism we were talking about. And right now I know what that was about. And note to self, uh, feel bad about this when you don't get to it later on. Okay. Pat Leahy is uh, demonstrably angry here. And he's tearing up the rule book because, as he says, uh, Republicans clearly don't respect it, so they might as well rip it up. So I did it for them. Uh, all right. So let me start by seeing if I can grab something. I saw Senator Feinstein uh, tweeting about this the other day, and I think she gave a brief description of just how noxious the bill itself was. So let's see. Here we go. We've got her tweet from, uh, well, now 17 hours ago. You figure out what time it was at that point. The Graham immigration bill, she says, would be a setback for immigrant children and families and essentially end our asylum system. It would make a bad situation even worse. She includes, of course, video of herself talking about that. Uh, that's what they do. Senate Judiciary Republicans, she also notes, broke four of the committee's 10 rules today, so they could force through Chairman Graham's immigration bill, a bill with no chance of becoming law that would only make the situation at the border worse. So I guess basically the big takeaway from all this is supposed to be it would basically gut asylum application rules and allow for, and you never really want to allow for this, but indefinite detention of, uh, well, of anybody, but in this case of children at the border, and that's pretty worrisome and the sort of thing that if you brought that bill to the Senate Judiciary Committee, you could expect a lot of opposition and some heated debate about. Well, Lindsey Graham didn't want opposition or heated debate about this thing. And apparently, I guess, uh, well, he, I guess he's the name sponsor of it. But all indications are that this is something that Trump demanded be considered. And I guess Lindsey Graham thought it was important for his relationship with Donald Trump to deliver on moving it forward, even though, as they they keep saying, a lot of critics keep saying, well, this has no chance of becoming law. I guess it just sort of depends on what you think law means. But if you're a traditionalist and you think passed uh, by both houses of Congress and presented to the president for signature and then entered onto the books as a statute. Well, sure. Then it probably doesn't have much chance of becoming law unless of course they are ripping up the rule book totally. And you know, we sometimes explore the possibility that that's what's happening here. So Pat Leahy now is complaining about it and uh, arguing that they have done away with the rule book entirely and uh, you know, it would take about a minute and a half to play his clip uh, getting agitated and ripping up the rule book. But I think you could probably guess what was going on there. Democrats, he says, had many serious substantive proposals for how to fix the problems that plague our immigration system and border. We filed over 100 amendments. Graham broke every rule and didn't allow us to offer any. And then he goes on to describe a couple of the amendments he wanted to offer. And that's a good substantive background. But I think the chief issue here is there are not that many standing rules in the Senate Judiciary Committee. And I think they're available online and you could read through them. But essentially, uh, we'll take Leahy's word for it that there are 10 and that four of them were broken. So what were the rules? Some of them more important than others. Uh the ones that were really just facially assaulted 
uh, include, as I understand it, in most committees, and this is the case in the Judiciary Committee too, you as chairman aren't allowed to simply spring a markup on people and say, this is a bill that I want considered and reported out of committee and I want to do it today. There is good reason for requiring notice be given to all the members of the committee so that they can actually have staff help them prepare for a hearing or markup. Um, and I believe the rule is that I think you need to basically, you, you have to announce a markup a, a week in advance and then wait on it for a week in order to give people time to get ready. And at a markup, as opposed to a hearing, uh, which, you know, is also important. But at a markup, a markup is where you would debate and propose amendments to the bill. So, you know, you really have to do some substantive background work and uh, get the Office of Legislative Counsel to help you draft legislative language, to make substantive changes. It requires research and drafting and all sorts of you know, coordination with other members, trying to see if you can uh, get backing for your amendment, et cetera, et cetera. It's real stuff, and that's why you're supposed to wait a week. And it's not a really huge imposition ordinarily for a real chairman of a real committee from a real political party uh, who's a real senator because you know that that's the rule and you know what it means to mark up a bill and you know when something's coming. What's happening here, of course, is they're on their way out for, what, four or five week recess. And Donald Trump is an extraordinarily stupid and impatient person. And he wants to be able to, to be, he wants to be told that his stupid pet bill is making progress. So that he can say very soon, in the next two weeks, we're going to, pass this law and it's going to become it's going to be great and wonderful and terrific people are going to love it whatever it is he wants to say about this stupid thing and he's not going to accept as an answer well we're on a five week break so Graham I don't know whether the request came to him late I don't know whether he dropped the ball and forgot about it uh, maybe or maybe it's just standard Trump operating procedure they were having a, guess what having a meal together who can believe it and he said you know what this the pastrami is really good. I want you to pass this law tomorrow. And Graham, I guess, probably considered at some point saying, you know, well, to, yeah, I don't have enough time to do this thing tomorrow. But then he realized he's been listening to the show and he realized, well, if you have the gavel and you have a majority of the committee willing to rubber stamp anything you do, no matter how stupid, dangerous, illegal, against the rules, what have you, unconstitutional, name it, doesn't matter. Uh, then I guess you can go ahead and do whatever you want. So he brings this thing for, uh, well, uh, he brings it up technically, I guess, uh, for a markup, which is the last stop before reporting the thing out for floor action, except um, the reason they call it the markup, of course, is that you're supposed to actually mark the bill up, make some changes, or at least consider some changes. This is where all the amendments would be considered. And everybody knew that the bill was coming at some point and had started to work on amendments, but the markup hadn't been noticed and they didn't anticipate it happening that day. So they objected and said, look, the, the rules are clear. They're yours. You proposed them for adoption when you took over the chairmanship of the committee. We all approved them because no big deal. It's the same rules as before, even though Pat Leahy has a terrible record uh, fighting for his beloved blue slip. So I don't know whether he necessarily voted. It may be that the minority members didn't vote for the rule because they're angry about the blue slip rule being eliminated. Or maybe, you know, maybe they didn't eliminate the blue slip rule. Maybe they just put it back in there, but they have no intention of honoring it. Who knows? I don't know. We'd have to look at the uh, online readout of the rules. But at any rate, they pointed out to him, yeah, you didn't notice this hearing or markup properly. And we have lots of amendments and uh, it's not fair. You're breaking the rules by bringing this thing up for a markup and trying to report it out on short notice. And he basically said, nah, you know, whatever, to hell with that. Um, and I guess if anybody has any questions about it, we'll have a vote. Oh, look, you lost the vote. The end. And then they moved on. 
Uh, but that was it. And Democrats were left sputtering and protesting. And Graham gave them time to vent. I suppose he could have just ruled that out of order too. And vent they did, but to no avail. Because these rules don't have teeth. There isn't very much that you can do about it in the face of a determined majority. So uh, they began saying, well, uh, some of our amendments are crafted. They're written already. Let's let's talk about those. I want to offer the amendments I'm ready on anyway. And Chairman Graham said, you know, that's probably going to take too long. Like I said, we've got to get this thing done before recess. So you know what? I'm going to say no amendments. Now, again, the rules are that you're allowed to offer those amendments. But he said, nah, you know, this thing I have in my hand, which functions as a gavel, because it is one, that's it. No amendments. I used the gavel. It's official. No amendments. So at this point, Democrats are apoplectic about this. But what are they going to do? That They could walk out. They could throw things. They tore up a rule book. But short of actually bashing him over the head, grabbing the gavel out of his hand and beating the crap out of him. And then, of course, you know, all the negative implications that come along with doing that. I don't recommend it. That's one thing you could do. But then you'd have to probably beat the crap out of every Republican on the committee and then fight the Capitol Hill police and the sergeant at arms. And even then you get the idea. So they wallowed in their frustration. They pointed out that he was breaking the rules. Um, I think one of the like the fourth rule that he broke was, you know, I guess a sort of a technicality. It was like, well, you know, these are the rules and you didn't follow them. So that's breaking the rules right there. Uh, OK, it's enough to say that you broke the first two first three rules, whatever they were. And some at some point he laid them out. Uh, Leahy continues here, describes some of the amendments he wanted to offer. Uh, the committee, he said, should start the immigration reform debate where we left off in 2013. And now he's bragging on his work there. Then, as chairman, I held five markups and 30 hours of debate. Okay, so considerably less for Graham here. Uh, he notes, even Chairman Graham this morning acknowledged that we need to deal with the conditions in the Northern Triangle. I wanted to offer the Central America Reform and Enforcement Act to do just that, but Graham didn't allow it. Boo-hoo. I mean, it is it's bad news, but okay. I, I, I get frustrated listening to Pat Leahy cry about these things because, of course, his answer of how to fight back is going to be, well, next time I'm chairman, I'll let them offer amendments and then they won't feel very good about that, will they? And then, of course, the next time they take over, they'll stop allowing amendments again and will be owned. But anyway, uh, so uh, he's incensed that all of this was done, as he says, for uh, in particular, because this bill will never become law anyway. In other words, he did it just to impress Donald Trump. Why won't it become law? Because, well, here are the, the standard answers for why it won't become law. Well, lots of people object to the very concept of the bill to begin with. And all Democrats will likely object to the fact that Democratic amendments weren't allowed either in markup or who knows what they'll allow on the floor so they'll likely oppose the thing. In other words, you would likely be able to uh, filibuster successfully against this bill because Republicans wouldn't be able to find 60 votes for cloture for considering the bill. However, it's probably worth reminding everybody that if you are required by the rules to allow for Democratic amendments and you're required by the rule to allow for a one-week notice, but you just say, eh, to hell with it, and I can get a majority of the committee to vote that it doesn't matter, you will, of course, realize that if you can get a majority of senators on the floor, uh, and the Republicans have such a majority, to vote that that doesn't matter either, then maybe you don't need 60 votes to go ahead and pass the thing in the Senate. That would be nuking the filibuster, Maybe, sort of, kind of. Of course, they might claim, well, it's just for this one situation, just like Bush v. Gore. Uh, other bills might still be subject to filibuster. You could claim whatever you want as the precedent. You can craft it any way you like. If you are absolutely bound and determined to approve it, no matter how ridiculous it is. Uh, of course, the other problem and the larger 
problem is that there isn't a Republican majority in the House, and the Democratic House would likely also be uh, unalterably opposed to passing this bill. Of course, again, maybe law isn't what you learned in grade school or high school, as the case may be, and uh, it'll just be enough that the Senate passed it really, in Trump size. You know, that's half the Congress. That's pretty good. One out of two ain't bad. And I like this thing. And I'm one, too. So uh, there you go. I pass. It has to pass two houses. It's passed the Senate and the White House. They call it the White House for a reason. It must be one of the houses that they're talking about. And that's what I'm going to consider it to be law. Or, you know, he might go the more traditional route, which is to say, uh, well outside of the traditional bounds of everything and simply issue an executive order mandating that uh, these procedures be implemented even without legislation. Y you never know what they're going to be willing to do. I guess the, the big question is how many Republicans and how many positions no longer f are interested in being bound by the rules. Now, there's another less dramatic way to derail this ahead of time. Technically, a bill that doesn't comply with committee rules would likely be subject to a point of order on the Senate floor. But again, that point of order could be waived by a bare majority. So I don't know that it stands as a really significant barrier to passage in the Senate. The greater barrier is passage in the House, but, you know, at some point, as uh, we've been observing on a long enough uh, authoritarian fascist timeline, I guess at some point they just say, nah, the House of Representatives is a pain in my ass. It doesn't count anymore. Long shot, big stretch, figment of the imagination. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But at any rate, uh, that helps explain some of what happened there. And some of what some of the remedies Democrats might or might not have available to them for fixing this mess. We'll be right back. Welcome back now to the Kango in the Morning Show here on Net Roots Radio. So, did we get the answer you were looking for? Serena was asking, I guess, on behalf of uh, herself and Time Killer. Uh, well, Time Killer was asking uh, since this procedure in the Judiciary Committee was out of order. Can this sham vote be stricken? Uh, they won't be able to do anything about striking it from the record of the Judiciary Committee, and it's not yet on the record of the Senate. But as I said, I guess the first line of defense is that Democrats could raise a point of order against the bill if it were brought up for consideration on the Senate floor. That would be waivable by bare majority. You may or may not be able to muster the votes for doing that. Uh, or it may never come up at all. Uh, one of the complaints uh, from the Democratic senators who were there was that there may not even really be any intention to bring this thing up for a vote on the Senate floor any time ever. It may all have been done in service of uh, Donald Trump's ego, maybe Lindsey Graham's ego, maybe they have a golf outing scheduled and... <clears throat> Graham didn't want to be yelled at for delaying until after the break for bringing forward this bill that will never pass. And so he just trampled over the committee rules for the sake of not having to hear Donald Trump yell at him if they're playing golf at some point during the next five weeks. That may be it. There may be more afoot. But, uh, you know, just another great example of if you have a determined majority, they can pretty much do whatever they want for, well, for as long as they can get away with it anyway. I have two other tweet threads which addressed the issue. I guess they look like they are from staffers or former staffers on the Senate Judiciary Committee. The first one here from Ira Goldman says, uh, uh, his Twitter bio here says, I used to write laws, then I invented Knee Defender. <laughs> you might know about that thing. Uh, is that, I think he's the guy. This is the Knee Defender is a product. I think that you would, you, if I recall correctly, you would, you would bring it on a plane with you and it would shield you from 
a jerky person in the in the row ahead of you uh, too quickly reclining their seat back and smashing into your knees. <laughs> That's really it. And I guess, did that get him out of having to do a 9 to 5? What a great idea. Anyway, I used to write laws, then I invented Knee Defender. Uh, X. HPSCI, House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Ex-Senate Trade, Tech, Telecom, Taxes, and Antitrust, Crime, and even Reputed Parliamentarian, Ira Goldman is. Um, He, uh, by the way, uh, embellishes his Twitter name with three duck uh, emojis. In a row. get it? I think he's about getting his ducks in a row. That's my guess as to what he's trying to do here. Anyway, he says, even from his own point of view, Graham's math doesn't add up. And he's explaining, once again, uh, why his gambit, uh, one, won't become law, and two, doesn't uh, his excuses for what he was doing don't add up. Maybe I think we ought to make this the second of the two Twitter threads. And look at this one first, uh, actually. Ben Orlebecki, uh, Orle- Orle- I don't know how he pronounces this. It's uh, O-R-L-E-B-E-K-E. And let's see. I don't know. I don't know, Ben. But uh, okay, well, he appears to have been watching this thing closely. And... Hmm. He's uh, from a from a progressive standpoint, he notes that much I can decipher from his uh, Twitter bio. Anyway, he's noting here. I think he was watching the whole proceeding. And as I recall, there is more to his thread. But I picked it up at this particular spot for a reason. He's, he notes here watching the markup. GOP senators laughing and checking phones while Senator Feinstein protests Graham breaking Senate Judiciary Committee and Senate rules to push through a vicious partisan immigration bill designed to please Trump. Senator Kennedy appears to be the only one listening throughout, looking nonplussed. As Feinstein is saying, this bill has no chance of becoming law. Graham is pushing it through so Trump will praise him. Multiple rules are being broken in the process. Notably, no Democratic chair has ever broken one of these rules. GOP has three times, but never before for legislation. Interesting. Klobuchar, he notes, has shown up fresh off from the debates. No Harris or Booker. A brief recap he offers us. Graham called a vote on a partisan immigration bill by one breaking the rule that requires it to be held over for one week, and two, breaking the rule to not allow debate prior to voting over Democratic objections. So not only were there no uh, amendments allowed, but no debate whatsoever, although he did allow people to vent about their anger about there being no debate allowed. I think they're really talking about debate of amendments here. This bill would, among other things, eliminate the Flores settlement, which is important for A lot of reasons, not the least of which that it will catch Armando's ear if he's listening. Um, We've discussed that in the past as being at the heart of uh, what has evolved as detention policy of the Trump administration for uh, unaccompanied minors seeking asylum at the border. So this is a bill that purports to eliminate, overrule, dispense with, uh, vitiate the Flores settlement, thus allowing for indefinite detention of children. Um, Feinstein, uh, he reports in his thread, this now going on 23 hours old, still talking, going through the most dangerous provisions of Graham's bill, uh, which, by the way, is called the Secure and Protect Act, which is an amazing amazingly Orwellian title, of course. It's S-1494, in case you feel like looking it up. Republicans, after voting unanimously for the bill, seem uninterested in the ways in which it would harm children and asylum seekers. They're barely listening to the complaints. Graham is very good about sounding somewhat reasonable, but then leaves the room and walks back whatever reasonable-sounding thing he said when he gets back in there. 
I don't know what he's finding out when he leaves the room. Graham, after breaking multiple rules, accuses Dems of being the bad guys for not going along with his partisan bill that harms vulnerable populations. Senator Leahy, who has been in the Senate Judiciary Committee for 40 years and spent many of them as chair, begins his statement and is pointing out that only one party breaks the committee rules. I might, you know, suggest that maybe it's time to be a little tougher on them if you ever get the chair back. He shows a copy of the rules to every, that every member of the committee voted for, says they're on the verge of becoming meaningless. Senator Leahy tears up a copy of the rules, saying they're meaningless now. He's right. This is an excellent statement, Ben thinks. Leahy is not holding back on Republicans. I, of course, know it to be, um, well, at the very least, frustrating, if not just empty garbage. I, Pat Leahy has a lot to recommend him, but being tough on Republicans and paying them back in kind is one thing that he absolutely refuses to do and thinks is a virtue. And I'm not so sure it always is. Sometimes, I'm sure, but not always. All right. Uh, he's calling for a uh, bipartisan immigration reform bill like they did in 2013. That's not going to happen. Graham is doing this whole indignation thing again, Ben says, because Dems have, in accordance with the rules, held up this horrible bill. Shades of Kavanaugh-style anger from Graham. Again, despite there being absolutely no chance of this bill becoming law, it's all for show. Graham accuses Dems of refusing to work with him. Dems have filed over 100 amendments to this bill, uh, which I guess is supposed to count as working with him on it, some of which are drawn directly from the 2013 bill that Leahy wanted to see considered again. Senator Durbin was there pointing out that the rules are specifically designed to prevent pure partisan bills. Dems blocking this bill last week is what Republicans have done many times. Dem chairman always stuck with the rules and tried to pass bipartisan legislation. And, and I guess we should say usually failed to do so because Republicans weren't interested in passing bipartisan legislation. They would use the rules to bottle up everything they could and never, I guess, Leahy thinks it's to his credit that he says all of these initiatives were successfully uh, stonewalled by Republicans and I never considered finding a way around their obstructionism and passing a decent bipartisan uh, piece of legislation over their objections and that's that's how great I am. Eh, I don't know. Graham pitching his bill as being necessary to vote on immediately because it would fix the border crisis. It would not. And then uh, uh, Senator Lee chiming in, defending Graham's bill, which again will not become law. Graham now cutting off further debate. Dems, especially Hirono, protesting. Graham is breaking the rules again. This is an absolute mess, he says. It's a Raw exercise of majority power and defiance of the committee rules and every member that every member voted for. So I guess Democrats did vote for it. Uh, did they eliminate the blue slip law uh, rules? Now we have something. That's actually a side story that's somewhat interesting to me. If the Dems voted for a, uh, a set of committee rules eliminating blue slips, well, I don't know what to tell you about that. Unless they just intend to finally carry that over into a Democratic majority at some point. Again, important to remember, Ben says, all this drama is for a partisan bill that will not become law because Graham wants a good phone call from Trump. Graham just powered this bill through while refusing to allow amendments, despite whining that Dems were the ones who weren't willing to play ball. I can testify that Dem staff was working 12-hour days minimum yesterday and arriving early today to earnestly work on substantive amendments. Maybe they should stop doing that. White House now giving an impassioned statement on the pointlessness of this whole mess. But uh, I guess at no point does Graham ever say um, no to the whining. He just knows that uh, in the end he's going to gavel through a vote and that's going to be the end of that. So, OK, there's that one. Then there's the Ira Goldman thread, which I think makes a separate point just to really beat this story to death. He begins by saying, even from his own point of view, Graham's math doesn't add up. What does this mean? He says he had to move his asylum bill because if the Judiciary Committee doesn't move bills, 
then the leadership of the Senate, the, Senate, the Republican leadership, will yank them out and the Judiciary Committee will become meaningless. But here's the problem. Graham didn't allow any amendments other than his own substitute. So what really makes a committee meaningless? Reporting a bill without allowing any amendments, a.k.a. having a markup. Because when it comes to bills, committees have two functions, hearings and markups. And as the committee don't, uh, committees don't actually need a bill to be referred in order to hold hearings on it. There's no need to have a referral. Graham could simply hold hearings and then draft a bill to his liking, introduce it, and he could arrange for McConnell to skip referring the bill to committee for markup and just have it sent straight to the calendar. Even better, hearings themselves are optional, so he could skip those too. Listening to Graham explain the series of events that led up to today, I can appreciate his frustration, but... When Graham had his asylum bill reported today without having allowed any amendments but his own to be offered, he actually moved more towards the very thing he claims he so wants to avoid, making the Judiciary Committee as a Senate committee meaningless in the bill-crafting process, bill-making process, is what he says. Yes, there are ways that he could have arranged this without hearings and without markups, but, uh, yeah, so this is his excuse. If I let the Democrats continue to bottle up this bill and refuse to report it out, and I think, by the way, one of the other rules that was uh, broken, I think the Judiciary Committee has a rule about not being able to report out a bill to the floor unless at least one member of the minority agrees to vote for it, which seems kind of crazy in these polarized partisan times. It It offers up. Uh, a, a minority veto power to any bill they don't like. And as we know, when there's a Democratic president and a Democratic majority in the Senate, Republicans will simply say, oh, I don't like any of their bills and we don't want to allow any of them to go forward. And that's a huge problem. And Democrats, for whatever reason, when Pat Leahy is chairman, take great pride in saying, God, nothing we can do and allowing two plus years to go by with almost literally nothing being reported out of the Senate Judiciary Committee of any substance. Certainly none of the reforms that a Democratic president would have wanted to would have promised during a campaign and would want to deliver on. And it's incredibly frustrating. It's very frustrating, I'm sure, for Pat Leahy. And I guess it was frustrating for Lindsey Graham in the few months that he's had the chair, too. But he just said, to hell with it. I'm not going to sit around and listen to Donald Trump yell at me. We're just going to push this thing through. And his excuse is, if we actually followed the rules, then it would render our committee meaningless. So in order to not render our committee meaningless, I am going to hold a markup on the bill in contravention to the rules and... Get it done today by not allowing any amendments and just push it out, which pretty much renders the committee meaningless. All that the committee was able to do yesterday was hold a grievance session where Democrats said this is terrible and Republicans checked their phones and laughed at them. So it's a good point that Ira makes. The committee in, the, in Graham's quest to prevent the Judiciary Committee from becoming meaningless, he rendered the committee meaningless except he did get the satisfaction of reporting his bill out. So basically, if he had obeyed the rules, then he and Leahy would be in the same position. They would both be terribly frustrated. They would both feel that they had been frustrated by partisan stonewalling, and they both would not have had their bills reported. The only difference is, well, Graham got his bill reported. So if you're into that sort of thing, I guess you might lean on that as precedent. I did see Brian Boitler saying yesterday, well, you would be well advised to treat this as precedent and approach your own legislative process this way when you take the majority back. The problem is that we know what will really happen is that Pat Leahy will say, it was such a disgrace what Lindsey Graham did that I, uh, I'm going to campaign on pledging to reinstate 
the real rules of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and I will never do such a thing to the Republicans. And so instead, the newly elected Democratic president will see his or her agenda frustrated for two minimum, possibly four years, possibly the whole time, by Republican obstructionism, as Pat Leahy uh, insists that he's doing a great job for Democrats nationally by sitting there watching nothing get done. But at least Lindsey Graham, he would have cheated and gotten things done. Not me. I'm not going to cheat, but I'm also not going to get things done. Aren't I virtuous? Keep me as chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. It's hard to encourage the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee to cheat. And it's not a very virtuous thing to insist that they get back at the Republicans. But it is pretty frustrating. Uh, Not exactly inspiring to know that that's what we face in a future under a Leahy chairmanship. But I think his days as chairman might be done. All right. We may as well move on to another subject here. But uh, let me see what Mike Musson was commenting on here over here. Trump continuing to ignore the law for things like succession. We've talked about that, right? Another of the instances in which he says, to hell with what the law says. So what if the Constitution says it has to be passed by the House? The law over here says that the uh, that I don't get to handpick an acting DNI, but I'm going to do it anyway. Is there some difference between the law and the Constitution? Uh, normally there is, but it won't make a difference for him. They're both just stupid pieces of paper as far as he's concerned. So let's see. Trump continuing to ignore the law for things like succession because there aren't consequences should be the first basis for impeachment. You are right. It's a cancer on the rule of law. Now we are seeing things like child separation where the administration is simply ignoring court orders. And I guess it's infecting the Senate as well. Um, although I guess maybe that uh, that bodes ill for actually getting a conviction. I mean, not like we really had a serious chance at it. Um, or I guess everyone could be excused for thinking that there are just Republicans who will not care and won't vote to convict and will never reach that two thirds threshold. And that's probably true. But, uh, um, well, man, that's just, uh, it's, it's, it's frightening when that disregard for the law, uh, infects the Senate. And I guess it's doubly frightening when, it infects the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, supposedly, I guess, tasked with upholding the rule of law in this country. So that's that's problematic. All right. I think that's the end of the uh, procedural inquiries here. My note to myself, which I've just remembered to go and take a look at, was that we wanted to take a look back on the question of domestic terrorism. Well, yeah. Now the part I forget is where did that come from again? Why were we looking at that? Was that from Katrina Mulligan's? Uh, national security thread on Ratcliffe. I think that was it. But I mentioned uh, there. there's a domestic uh, terrorism component that I want to bring up, and that comes from Yahoo News, This uh, an exclusive of Yahoo News. I don't know if it's still exclusive, but it was then, or maybe they were lying. Maybe all the rules are out, out the window. Uh, Yana or Jana Winter is the writer of this piece, this exclusive piece at Yahoo. FBI document warns conspiracy theories are a new domestic terrorism threat. Long story short here, just to uh, let you know that I'm going to be wasting a lot of time reading the article to you. Long story short, in case you have to leave, is uh, they're basically saying specifically that the lunatics at QAnon and related conservative conspiracy theory communities are now to be considered a domestic terrorism threat. And I think they're right on here. And I think a lot of you will agree. Uh, We were mentioning just the other day that uh, recently we saw the second or third or maybe even more. uh, I I don't know. There may be more that I'm not aware of, but the second or third time of which I'm aware that a QAnon believer activist had showed up someplace armed and threatened some serious violence. And in some cases they actually uh, go through with their threats and commit that violence. So it's about time 
that the FBI would recognize what's going on here. The FBI, the, the story says, says for the first time has identified fringe conspiracy theories as a domestic terror threat, according to a previously unpublicized document obtained by Yahoo News. And you can read the document below, and uh, I don't know how long it is. It might be worth taking a look through. Um, the FBI intelligence bulletin came from the Bureau's Phoenix field office, dated May 30th, 2019, and describes conspiracy theory-driven domestic extremists as a growing threat and notes that it is the first such report to do so. It lists a number of arrests, including some that haven't even been publicized, see, related to violent incidents motivated by fringe beliefs. As exciting as this is, I think at this point, we probably should take note of the fact that uh, I don't know how much sway this memo it really is going to have or whether I'm, I'm a little hesitant about whether it's fair to say the FBI has come to this conclusion. This is an FBI intelligence bulletin from the Phoenix field office, which I think you could justifiably claim doesn't represent FBI policy. Although Yahoo News is certainly portraying it that way, and they may even be right in the end. I mean, it may ha it may be extraordinarily meaningful when a field office issues something like this. But I have the feeling that, well, certainly under the Trump administration, I have a feeling that uh, even if, if they finally become aware of this thing as being dangerous to their cause, they will simply direct the Department of Justice to direct the FBI not to adopt this as national policy. They may not be able to do anything about rescinding a memo from the Phoenix field office, but then again, they might. If you can ask uh, an attorney general to unrecuse, you could probably demand that the Phoenix field office unissue their report. Anyway, they shouldn't have to because it seems they're right. We'll continue on with this story here. The document specifically mentions QAnon a shadowy network that believes in a deep state conspiracy against President Trump and Pizzagate, the theory, of course, that a pedophile ring, including Clinton Associates, was being run out of the basement of a Washington, D.C. pizza restaurant, parentheses, which didn't actually have a basement, and parens. They could have just come out and said, by the way, that's garbage, but I think you're supposed to infer that from the tenor of the article. Anyway, uh... Yeah, so specifically mentioning QAnon. So I just thought also another great, you know, I think interesting connection for this piece is you got a situation where at least an FBI field office is issuing this report saying this is a domestic terrorism threat. QAnon is. It specifically mentions QAnon as a domestic terrorism threat. Yesterday, last night, Trump had another of his stupid rallies this time. And where was he? In Cincinnati, I think and uh, holding another rally. And prior to the rally beginning, even before they started, I saw photographers on the scene uh, tweeting around their photos of the people who had showed up in Q t-shirts and holding Q signs and other various uh, hints to one another that they were uh, believers in the QAnon conspiracy. It's a very prominent feature, it seems, at least from the press photographers who attend these events. You see them all the time. You see signs and t-shirts and things being waved in the crowd and being acknowledged by the president. And the president, with some frequency, retweets QAnon tagged uh, uh, messages that are uh, rife with really the just the most completely nutty conspiracy theorizing out there. And it should be noted for the record, then, that the, if the Phoenix field office is right here, the president of the United States is literally palling around with terrorists. Uh, or perhaps uh, if you're more generous to the president and are concerned about his safety, you might wonder why the Secret Service allows people who are openly connecting themselves with something that's been identified by the FBI as a domestic terrorism threat to wander the aisles at his events. But of course, uh, if it's your own conspiracy theorist army who are cling clinging to their guns for 
the purpose of wreaking political violence throughout the country on your behalf, then I guess it doesn't concern you a great deal. They're probably not going to shoot the president. But don't you think the Secret Service ought to crack down on that? And maybe they want to, but they've been given countermanding orders from the White House. Don't do it. Yes, they're domestic terrorists, but they're our domestic terrorists, and we want them to be on display at our rallies. I'm not sure that they've given that, but many people are saying that they are. Believe me. So that's probably good enough. I don't know anything about that. We'll be right back. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Roots Radio. Let us uh, continue with this uh, FBI report story from Yahoo News. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the document does specifically mention QAnon, who were out in force at the rally last night. So that's kind of curious all by itself. The FBI, it says, assesses these conspiracy theories very likely will emerge spread and evolve in the modern information marketplace, occasionally driving both groups and individual extremists. Not <clears throat> when I say both groups, um, I don't think that they're it's that they're talking about two specific groups, but they mean that both groups and individuals who believe in this extremist conspiracy theory would then carry out criminal or violent acts. It also goes on to say that the FBI believes conspiracy theory driven extremists are likely to increase during the 2020 presidential election cycle. And they're probably right. The FBI said another factor driving the intensity of this threat is, quote, the uncovering of real conspiracies or cover ups involving illegal, harmful or unconstitutional activities by government officials or leading political figures. The FBI does not spe uh, specify which political leaders or which cover-ups it was referring to, but that's an interesting question all by itself. Hmm. The uh, uh, President Trump is mentioned by name briefly in the latest FBI document, which notes that the origins of QAnon are um, is the conspiratorial belief that Q, allegedly a government official, posts classified information online to reveal a covert effort led by President Trump to dismantle a conspiracy involving deep state actors and global elites allegedly engaged in an international child sex trafficking ring. This recent intelligence bulletin comes as the FBI is facing pressure to explain who it considers an extremist and how the government prosecutes domestic terrorists. In recent weeks, the FBI director has addressed domestic terrorism multiple times, but did not publicly mention this new conspiracy theory threat. The FBI is already under fire for its approach to domestic extremism. In a contentious hearing last week before the Senate Judiciary Committee, and you know what that's worth, FBI Director Christopher Wray faced criticism from Democrats who said the Bureau was not focusing enough on white supremacist violence. The term white supremacist, white nationalist, is not included in your statement to the committee when you talk about threats to America, Senator Richard Durbin said. There is a reference to racism, which I think probably was meant to include that, but nothing more specific. Ray told lawmakers the FBI had done away with separate categories for black identity extremists and white supremacists and said the Bureau was instead now focusing on racially motivated violence. But he added, I will say that a majority of the domestic terrorism cases that we've investigated are motivated by some version of what you might call white supremacist violence. That's something, anyway. 
The FBI had faced mounting criticism for the term black identity extremists after it was after its use was revealed by Foreign Policy magazine in in 2017. Critics pointed out that the term was an FBI invention based solely on race, since no group or even any specific individuals actually identify as black identity extremists. In May, Michael C. McGarity, the FBI's assistant director for the counterterrorism division, who uh, I guess uh, is the chief of the or are the assistant chief of those who are being forced to continually brief the actual perpetrators of election interference on their investigation of that election interference, which we discussed last week. Uh, McGarity, the assistant director of counterterrorism, told Congress the bureau now classifies domestic terrorism threats into four main categories, racially motivated violent extremism, anti-government slash anti-authority extremism, animal rights slash environmental extremism. And really, when was the last time? I mean, I, I know that there was a scare about that many, many years ago. When was the last time you heard about uh, an actual dangerous animal rights environmental extremist uh, action? That came to fruition, by the way. And the last one is abortion extremism, which should probably be termed anti-abortion extremism. I don't know that there's ever been a credible complaint that people were pro-abortion extremists and perpetrating violence. Although I assume that anti-abortion forces think that that's the case. They keep telling us that they're perpetrating a Holocaust, obviously. Anyway, abortion extremism, a term the Bureau uses to classify both pro-choice and anti-abortion extremists. But I, I just question whether there are any. The new focus on conspiracy theorists appears to fall under the broader category of anti-government extremism. This is the first FBI product examining the threat from conspiracy theory-driven domestic extremists and provides a baseline for future intelligence products, the document states. The new category is different in that it focuses not on racial motivations, but on violence based specifically on beliefs that, in the words of the FBI document, attempt to explain events or circumstances as the result of a group of actors working in secret to benefit themselves at the expense of others, and are quote, usually at odds with official or prevailing explanations of events. Okay. The FBI acknowledges conspiracy theory-driven violence is not new, but says it's gotten worse with advances in technology combined with an increasingly partisan political landscape in the lead-up to the 2020 presidential election. The advent of the Internet and social media has enabled promoters of conspiracy theories to produce and share greater volumes of material via online platforms that larger audiences of consumers can quickly and easily access, the document says. The bulletin says it's intended to provide guidance and inform discussions within law enforcement as they relate to potentially harmful conspiracy theories and domestic extremism. The Phoenix field office referred Yahoo News to the Bureau's national press office, which provided a written statement. And I guess here it is. While our standard practice is not is to not comment on specific intelligence products. The FBI routinely shares information with our law enforcement partners in order to assist in protecting the communities they serve, the FBI said. In its statement, the FBI also said it can, quote, never initiate an investigation based solely on First Amendment protected activity. As with all of our investigations, the FBI can never monitor a website or social media platform without probable cause. The Department of Homeland Security, which has also been involved in monitoring domestic extremism, did not return or acknowledge emails and phone requests for comment. While not all conspiracy theories are deadly, those identified in the FBI's 15-page report led to either attempted or successful carried out, successfully carried out violent attacks. For example, the Pizzagate conspiracy led to a 28-year-old man uh, invading a Washington, D.C. restaurant, Comet Pizza, to rescue the children he believed were being kept there and fire an assault-style weapon inside. The FBI document also cites an unnamed California man who was arrested on December 19, 2018, 
after being found with what appeared to be bomb-making materials in his car. The man allegedly was planning, quote, to uh, blow up a satanic temple monument in the Capitol Rotunda in Springfield, Illinois, to make Americans aware of Pizzagate and the New World Order, who were dismantling society, the document says. Historian David Garrow, the author of a Pulitzer Prize-winning biography of Martin Luther King Jr., who has worked extensively with FBI archives, raised doubts to Yahoo News about the memo. He says the FBI's default assumption is that violence is motivated by ideological beliefs rather than mental illness. The guy who shot up the pizza place in D.C., do we think of him as a right-wing activist or insane? Garrow asked. I mean, I would say both, but okay. Garrow was similarly critical of the FBI's use of the term black identity extremists and related attempts to ascribe incidents like the 2016 shooting of six police officers in Baton Rouge to black radicalism. He said the shooter, Gavin Long, had a history of mental health problems. The Bureau's presumption, the mindset, is to see ideological motives where most of the rest of us see individual nuttiness, he said. Identifying conspiracy theories as a threat could be a political lightning rod, since President Trump has been accused of promulgating some of them, with his frequent references to a deep state and his praise in 2015 for Alex Jones, who runs the conspiracy site InfoWars. While the FBI intelligence bulletin does not mention Jones or InfoWars by name, it does mention some of the conspiracy theories frequently associated with the far-right radio host, in particular, the concept of the New World Order. Jones claimed the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, in which 26 children were killed, was a hoax, a false flag operation, intended as a pretext for the government to seize or outlaw firearms. How's that working, by the way? The families of a number of victims have sued Jones for defamation, saying his conspiracy-mongering contributed to death threats and online abuse that they have received. While Trump has never endorsed Sandy Hook denialism, he was almost uh, he was almost up until the 2016 election the most high-profile promoter of the birther conspiracy that claimed that former President Barack Obama, you know that one, wasn't born in the United States. He later dropped his claim and deflected criticism by pointing the finger at Hillary Clinton. He said her campaign had given birth to the conspiracy and Trump finished it. Mm-hmm. There is no evidence that Clinton started the birther conspiracy. That's what it says here. Uh, Joe Yusinski, an associate professor of political science at the University of Miami, whose work on conspiracy theories is cited in the Intelligence Bulletin, said there's no data suggesting conspiracy theories are any more widespread now than in the past. There is absolutely no evidence that people are more conspiratorial now, says Yusinski, after Yahoo News described the bulletin to him. They may be, but there's not strong evidence showing this. It's not that people are becoming more conspiratorial, says Usinski, but conspiracies are simply getting more media attention. Well, well, that may do the trick. We are looking back at the past with very rosy hindsight to forget our beliefs pre-internet in JFK assassination conspiracy theories and red scares. My gosh, we have conspiracy theories about the King of England written into the Declaration of Independence, he said, referring to claims that the king was planning to establish tyranny over the American colonies. It's not that conspiracy theorists are growing in number, Yusinski argues, but that media coverage of those conspiracies has grown. For most of the last 50 years, 60 to 80 percent of the country believe in some form of JFK conspiracy theory, he said. They're obviously not all extremists. Conspiracy theories, including Russia's role in creating and promoting them, attracted widespread attention during the 2016 presidential election when they crossed over from Internet chat groups to mainstream news coverage. Yahoo News' Conspiracy Land podcast recently revealed that Russia's Foreign Intelligence Service was the origin of a hoax report that tied the murder of Seth Rich, a DNC staffer, to Hillary Clinton. We did cover that story as well, yeah? Washington police believe that Rich was killed in a botched robbery and that there's no proof that his murder had any political connections. Among the violent conspiracy theorists cited in the May FBI document 
is one involving a man who thought Transportation Security Administration agents were part of a new world order. Another focused on the high-frequency active oral research program, A-U-R, auroral, sorry, auroral research program, or H-A-A-R-P. Did you even know such a thing existed? High-frequency active auroral research program, HARP. (laughs) The A-A-R-P people aren't going to be happy about that one. This is a government-funded facility in Alaska that has been linked to everything from death beams to mind control. And I think what you mean here is baselessly linked by conspiracy nuts to death beams and mind control, although maybe that's what they're up to. I really don't know. The two men arrested in connection with HARP were, quote, stockpiling weapons, ammunition, and other tactical gear in preparation to attack the facility, believing it was being used to control the weather, which lots of people think about many things, but this this part is new. It's being used to control the weather and to prevent humans from talking to God. That is a new angle. Nate Snyder, who served as a Department of Homeland Security counterterrorism official during the Obama administration, said that the FBI appears to be applying the same radicalization analysis it employs against foreign terrorism, like the Islamic State group, which has recruited followers in the United States. I don't know if that's such a bad model. Although, I do have my doubts about the efficacy of their uh, efforts afterwards, but... I think it's probably wise if we keep asking questions like where were they radicalized that we ought to ask that about white extremists here in the U.S. too. The domestic violent extremists cited in the bulletin are using the same playbook that groups like ISIS and Al Qaeda with a Q and everything have used to inspire, recruit and carry out attacks, said Snyder. After reviewing a copy of the bulletin provided by Yahoo News, you put out a bulletin and say this is the content they're looking at. And if some guy saying he's a religious cleric or philosopher, if he's saying that, then you look at the content, videos on YouTube, etc., that they are pushing and show how people in the U.S. might be radicalized by that content. Though the FBI document focuses on ideological motivations, FBI Director Ray, in his testimony last week, asserted that the FBI is concerned only with violence, not people's beliefs. The FBI doesn't investigate ideology, no matter how repugnant, he told lawmakers, we are, or how benign, for that matter. Um, and they break that rule. The FBI doesn't investigate ideology, no matter how repugnant. We investigate violence and any extremist ideology when it turns to violence, or they think it will. We are all over it. In the first three quarters of this year, we've had more domestic terrorism arrests than the prior year. And it's about the same number of arrests as we have on the international terrorism side. Yet the proliferation of the extremist categories concerns Michael German, a former FBI agent and now a fellow with the Brennan Center for Justice uh, or for the Center's Liberty and National Security Program. It's part of the radicalization theory the FBI has promoted despite empirical studies that show it's bogus, he said. Well, that's serious and worthy of some attention. German says this new category is a continuing part of FBI overreach. They like the radicalization theory because it justifies mass surveillance, he said. If we know everyone who will do harm is coming from this particular community, mass surveillance is important. We keep broadening the number of communities we include in extremist categories. That is a good counterpoint. I kind of have to agree, right? If it's just an excuse to say, well, okay, this gives us the right to monitor this other half of the population, which we're not currently monitoring, that's troubling by itself. But but on the other hand, at least we all ought to be on the same footing. If they can monitor Muslim communities for fear of terrorism, uh, but white supremacist communities are the ones perpetrating that terrorism, they ought to be monitored Two, I guess, or else, uh, as German seems to be arguing, maybe no one ought to be monitored. For Garrow, the historian, the FBI's expansive definition has its roots in bureau paranoia that dates back decades. I think it's their starting point, he said. This goes all the way back to the Hoover era without question. They see ideology as a central motivating factor in human life, and they don't see mental health issues as a major factor. That, too, is a good point. 
Yet trying to label a specific belief system as prone to violence is problematic, he said. I don't think most of us would do a good job in predicting what sort of wacky information would lead someone to violence or not lead anyone to violence, Garrow said. Pizzagate would be a great example of that. Mm, except that it has led people to violence. But okay, maybe you should... I guess the idea here is, well, it was only one or two people. While Trump may not be supportive of labeling a group like QAnon, which sees him as a hero as extremist, he is in favor of broadening the number of organizations that are labeled as violent extremists, at least on the left. On Saturday, President Trump tweeted that Antifa, the I think that's the pronunciation they like going with these days, a far left movement opposed to what it considers fascism should be labeled a terrorist organization. Snyder, the former Homeland Security official, agrees that conspiracy theories may in fact inspire violence and be a threat, but questions what the government is going to do about it. He notes that the Department of Homeland Security um, at the department, nearly all, if not all, the intelligence analysts focusing on domestic extremist groups were eliminated under the Trump administration. There is no one there doing this, he said. And maybe some of the critics of the report would be happy about that. Um, I'm not, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not certain where policy-wise you ought to land. But certainly, I guess, so long as you are uh, monitoring and labeling activists on the left or activists in uh, or that you suspect of having connections to international terrorism, that is to say, Islamic extremist terrorism, I guess it's so long as you're monitoring that, but attacks are actually coming here uh, at a considerably brisker pace, let's say, from the white supremacist extremists. You, yeah, we have a hard time arguing for continuing the monitoring of Muslim communities while ignoring the activities among the white supremacists. But there is a good theoretical point, certainly, to pointing out that, well, maybe the real answer is to not be watching either of them. Um, though that does feel a little bit like uh, maybe we would be uh, doing ourselves a disservice were that the direction. But uh, it's an interesting theoretical uh, policy-making point to consider. Anyway, all right, so you can debate that, chew on that over the weekend. Chew on this while you're at it. Uh, impeachment inquiry now supported by a majority of Democratic House members. Uh, Mark Sumner wrote this up on the front page of Daily Coast just uh, yesterday because we just passed that threshold. By the way, my own observation, uh, politically speaking, strictly from political analysis here, uh, if you're worried about or wondering where Nancy Pelosi is on all this and whether she has a strategy in mind about finally uh, releasing, you know, letting the leash slip here. Uh, in addition to just having passed the, the threshold of the majority of the Democratic House caucus, it's also the case that a majority of California Democrats in the House, the the House Democratic delegation from California is now majority signed on to this impeachment inquiry uh, movement, I guess you could call it. So uh, just in terms of the people that she, that Nancy Pelosi may be closest to politically in many cases, and she's not taking advice from every single one of the House members from Democratic House members from California simply by virtue of the fact that they're from California. But, you know, she she caucuses with them and she draws some measure of her political strength from them. I think it's important to note they're going to fly back and forth together quite frequently and talk one with one another. I mean, it may or may not sway her. This might have been going on for a long time. A lot of the early adopters were California Democrats, but I'll note it for the record. Um, so I don't know who put us over the top here, but it might have been Ted Deutsch, whose uh, op-ed we read the other day. Um, let's see. Among the most recent group to sign on, Mark notes down here closer to the bottom of his piece are Representatives Mike Levin, 
my own representative, Jennifer Wexton, that removes a lot of pressure for me, and Jason Crow. Last Friday, Representative Catherine Clark also spoke out for impeachment. In total, 118 of the 235 Democratic voting members were not counting uh, the non-voting in the on the House floor anyway. Uh, delegates and resident commissioner of Puerto Rico because, I don't know, we just feel like not doing that. And 118 does meet the halfway threshold, whereas I guess not, I don't know whether any of them, I think uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton has signed on to that, but I guess uh, we must be behind uh, from the representatives uh, from Guam and the U.S. Virgin Islands and American Samoa and the like. But... Uh, Anyway, 118 of the 235 Democratic voting members have now announced their support for beginning proceedings. And of course, as we read yesterday, Ted Deutsch says, yeah, well, they've already begun regardless. But uh, all right, duly noted. Let's see. Um, What we haven't mentioned today is, uh, I guess, today's Trump racist attacks on Elijah Cummings uh, saga continues. Uh, It was... It came to our attention yesterday, I think, f- uh, for me, via a tweet from uh, from uh, Wolfram, if, uh, if I recall correctly. I'm going to scroll back. Um, noting that Baltimore police had recently announced that, uh, yeah, here it is, William Wolfram's tweet, uh, I'll, I'll just, he's commenting on a Mike Helgren tweet from uh, an investigative reporter for CBS News who says, breaking yesterday, 18 hours ago, Congressman Elijah Cummings' home was broken into. Baltimore police are investigating. He's got a screen grab here that says, from Baltimore City Police, they are investigating a report of a burglary that occurred on July 27th, 2019 at approximately 3.40 a.m. at a home in the 2000 block of Madison Avenue. At this time, it is unknown if any property was taken from the location. The screen grab doesn't say anything about it being Elijah Cummings' house, but I guess they happen to know that this is the case. There's a thread attached to this, so maybe they discuss how they came to know that that was where he lived. Uh, Helgren notes right afterwards, we are just learning about this, but it happened Saturday, the same day the president started tweeting about Cummings. Now, the comment that caught my eye from Wolfram, was that he says on a long enough fascist timeline, the survival rate for journalists and opposing politicians drops to zero. In other words, it was a hint that um, President Trump had launched these attacks and that his supporters had taken out their frustration and anger with Elijah Cummings by breaking into his house. It was also subsequently pointed out, though, that at 3.40 a.m. on July 27th, the president had not yet launched his attacks or at least his latest round of attacks on Elijah Cummings. But I am not certain that that separates the incident, quite honestly. I will say I have zero evidence for this, but I will say that uh, if he were aware of his anger and frustration with Elijah Cummings, and uh, according to some of the articles we read earlier this week, he has every reason to know that Elijah Cummings and his report was going to be coming down on him like a ton of bricks, even though the report said that they might, they, no one was sure whether Trump actually knew. Um, uh, you know, if your attack was going to be that Elijah Cummings lives in an, an urban hellhole and has done nothing about it, well, then I think a good bit of backup for your claim that the area was crime infested would be to have the guy's very house broken into so that you could point to that and say, hell, even your house got broken into. How could you possibly disagree with me? I must be right in my attacks. And, you know, ordinarily the sort of thing you say, well, that just seems like conspiracy theory. And you got to be careful about being a conspiracy theorist now. The FBI could start tracking this. So now I'm in trouble. Um, but would you, you know, put it past Donald Trump to say, I need somebody to break into that guy's house so that I can talk about how crime infested it is? Although you would have thought that he would have started with that attack. Although then people would say, how did you know that it was broken into? The police haven't even reported that yet. Well, I know everything. The DOJ tells me everything. So, no, probably not. So probably a good observation to look at the timeline there. But uh, then again, uh, maybe not. Maybe you wouldn't put it past 
Donald Trump. Yes, uh, I, I did clear that up. I was tweeting about that during one of the breaks. I'm aware that the house was broken into prior to the attacks, but then again, what a great justification for those attacks if you also know that you've got the robbery in your back pocket. Or so many people are saying, what can I tell you? Believe me, lots of people are saying, they're crying, they're calling me on the telephone saying, I did it, sir, and uh, that's that. Or I don't know anything about that. That's the, all right. What's the big deal about Cummings' house being broken into? Nothing. It's just that uh, I guess the the implication, Karen, since you're asking, was that uh, maybe it was a Trump supporter taking out his frustration on behalf of the president, uh, which would be a fairly serious development, I think. All right, time to hand things over to Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy and get the hell out of here for the weekend. We'll be back on Monday. Let me see what I can squeeze in for you about the show. From Daily Coos Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the K-Grow in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Let me go to the international news. Uh, Britain's pro-EU Liberal Democrats cut the governing Conservatives' majority to one parliamentary seat in a major blow to Boris Johnson. But you got to keep an eye on that guy because, uh, well, I'm going to be watching that Netflix movie over the weekend if I can. More to come on developments like that next week.